morning again. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and in our faith tradition as disciples of Christ, this is the Sunday of peace. I will point out that the various attributes assigned to the four Sundays of Advent do vary from one denomination to another. So if you hear a member of another denomination talking about Advent, or maybe a Facebook post about this being the Sunday of something other than peace, do not let this disturb your peace. There's more than one way to divide these different aspects of God's grace and love for us. If last Sunday it seemed peculiar to talk about hope in this world, with all the, the oh, excuse me, with all the violence and discord that seems to have become our new reality, then speaking this morning of peace certainly seems like a flight of fancy. One of the problems with our day and age is that the internet and 24-hour news channels we see so much of the downside of human nature. Violence and mayhem leave the news, and all of the new quick faith websites out there thrive on the seamy side of humanity as well. Having said that, though, all humans have a deep-seated and abiding longing for peace. I know I've told the Native American parable about the two wolves, the good wolf and the bad wolf, all of us have both good and evil battling within us. Some have either some have either through their conscious choices or through the circumstances of their lives, abuse, neglect, accidents, or injury, have been so damaged emotionally and spiritually that their lives are marked by hatred and fear, and all too often violence and chaos. I should interject here that not all violence is physical. All too often it's emotional or spiritual violence. We've all encountered, or we've actually been, that person who thrives on chaos. There are some people, as the saying goes, who just aren't content unless the whole world is in flames. These souls live, live it seems, to stir the pot, as they say, and to sow the seeds of discontent and discord wherever they pass. All too many of these folks call themselves Christians. Some are even in the ministry. But this is not what Christ calls us to be, not by any stretch. We are, of course, called to be agents of reconciliation and grace, just as Christ was to this world. Try as we might, peace eludes us. Humans seem to be constantly at war with one another. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of humanity. Our predilection towards violence hasn't abated, and our capacity for destruction has taken many leaps forward. We now have the capacity to destroy the world several times over. As we've moved now nearly a dozen and a half years into the 21st century, the unrest and destruction seems to have taken on a new life. It seems that war and destruction in some parts of the world is just standard operating procedure. The Middle East has certainly known no peace, not that it ever has, actually. Just these last few weeks, Israel has literally been burning with fires started by arsonist terrorists. A renewed determination devoted to hatred and violence has taken central stage as radical Islam strives to destroy the very basics of peace. It would seem that there could never be peace in this world as long as there is radical Islam. Islam Excuse me, Islam, along with far too many other ideologies and individuals, seems locked in hatred, mistrust, ulterior motives, lies, violence, retribution, and revenge. As I've related before, these influences have even corrupted our churches, and we find ourselves all too often standing on ancient battlegrounds. If we wage war with one another over past slights of all kinds, we are no different than the battles of cultures that still wage wars over things that happened centuries ago. Nothing is worse than a war over injuries suffered centuries past by parties long since gone from this world. Whether that war be like the complicated war we found ourselves in in Bosnia, or the Middle East, or the tentacles of racism that we still suffer today. To hate, distrust, demand, 
restitution from one race or another over slights and injuries suffered by a race where not one of the individuals involved in the injuries remains alive today is the epitome of racism. To hate, distrust, and wage a war of conflict with another individual or individuals within the walls of our own faith over past slights and disagreements is the epitome of being unchrist-like. The conflict, the conflict rages not only between us, but within us. In an increasingly fragmented and frantic world, the quest for inner peace seems ever more urgent. The rise of interest in spirituality in recent decades attests to this strong desire for inner calm and harmony. We recognize that something is out of place in our lives, that we are being pushed and pulled in several directions at once by pressures and demands of our culture, and many of us have lost a sense of peace and inner harmony that characterizes a centered and balanced life. We hope and long for inner peace. Isaiah 11, verses one through nine. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of, and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips he, we will, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hands into the viper's nest. They will neither destroy, harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth, cover the sea, excuse me. It is no wonder then that our hearts respond to the promise of peace, images of peace like the one drawn by the prophet of Isaiah awaken our deep desire for harmony and peaceful coexistence. Envisioning a future king who would, would judge the poor with righteousness and decide with equity for the meek on the earth of the earth, the wolf will lie with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will leave them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will be strong like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. Israel longed for such a day, and so do we. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that such a reign has begun. The kingdom of God is at hand. Luke tells us that the birth of Jesus was marked by a choir of angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace. Goodwill among men. And Mark reports that Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The vision of peace for which we long is no longer just a far off ideal, distant and unattainable, but a dream that can be and is being realized today. What is the peace that Jesus brings us? First and foremost, it is a peace with God. In Christ, the God who created us and loves us reconciles us to himself. Paul declares to the Christians in Rome that God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were God's enemies, Paul says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. And therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are forgiven, restored, and reconciled with God through Christ. And that gives us a sense of peace that can never be taken away. We have been 
reconciled to God in Christ, we have also been reconciled to one another in Christ. To the Gentile Christians at Ephesus, Paul writes, Remember that you were at one time without Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made all mankind, Gentiles and Jews, into one, and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us, so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. Thus putting to death that hostility through it, so he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in the one spirit to the Father. In Christ, God has broken down the walls to separate us and divide us, and offered us a way to peace. There is no longer male against female, Jew against Greek, slave against free, immigrant against native, black against brown, gay against straight, suburban against urban, young against old. We are all one in Christ. Because of Christ, peace is possible. peace that God offers and calls us to is a peace built on the foundation of justice. God's peace is not achieved by the strong dominating the weak. Such domination may bring a temporary end to conflict and war, but it will not bring about true peace. The kingdom of God is a peaceful kingdom, a transformed society in which each member is valued and treated with dignity. The weak and the strong live together in harmony, each caring for the other. There is no true peace without justice. We are not only to desire this peace, but to work for it. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus tells us, for they will be called children of God. We are called to be peacemakers, reconciling people to God, and reconciling them to one another. I would be remiss, however, if I did not point out that all too often in the world and the church today, the concept of justice has been co-opted by the desire for revenge and punishment. Far, far too often when I hear a cry for justice, I actually hear a cry for revenge and punishment for a real or imagined slight. Whether it be past or present, the desire for revenge is there front and central. The desire for revenge and punishment is all prevalent in human justice. But to imply that it is the component of God's justice means forgetting entirely what we celebrate each week at this communion table. Pursuit of human justice will never give us God's peace. Any cry for justice that does not include and offer front and center grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation is not God's justice and will not bring us God's peace. Just as I mentioned last week, the first Sunday of Advent, when we were discussing hope, and I mentioned that if we were, if we are placing your hope in human beings then you most assuredly will be let down. Likewise, if you are searching for peace among the things of this world, you will find your peace to be fragile and infrequent at best. If you want long-lasting, permanent, and abiding peace, you need to look for it in the heart of God. Just as with the only true hope that we have is in his, this life, excuse me, just as with the only true hope that we have in this life, real peace, lasting peace, and only be found through God. One of my favorite quotes, and I have no idea who said it first, is, Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. The peace that is offered in and through Christ is a deep and abiding peace, an inner peace that is independent of circumstances. This peace abides in joy and in suffering. It stays with us when we have a sense that God is present and when God seems absent. No one can take it from us. It has been given to us by Christ and is the result of our union with God through Him. No person or circumstance can rob us of it. It is a peace that endures. As Jesus prepared His disciples, He says to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do 
not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This inner peace can only be given to us by Christ. The world cannot offer anything like it. It is Christ's gift to us, freedom from fear and worry, and the, deep, and the deep security of knowing that we are loved by God and held by God at every moment of our lives. Sickness and health and sorrow and in joy in bad times and in good. Be at peace. Do not be afraid. Acquire peace in your heart, and thousands will find salvation around you. When you receive and abide in God's glorious peace, the peace that only Christ can give, we become the kind of people who can live at peace with others and who can be channels of peace in our communities and in our world. This is the peace we long for and which Christ brings us, a peace that passes human understanding, that is steady and sure regardless of life's circumstances, and it, that endures forever. We long for that peace. We can receive that peace. And we can have that, and we can give that peace really freely to others. Make me an instrument of your peace, pray St. Francis. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Think of it. Instruments of God's peace. What higher calling could there be? What greater gift could we desire? This is the hymn says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Mind thou our sad division cease, and by thyself our Thank you. 